I'm Brandon Scroggins, a pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and we are so thankful that you've stopped here to check out the content, which is such a central part of the life of our church. We truly believe that there is hope for you right now in Christ. At RBC, we believe that it's vital to worship God, to disciple one another, and to be a witness to the world, to pierce every area of life, every nation and generation with the good news of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe that it's essential to teach sound doctrine in the context of our homes through family worship, and then to gather in corporate worship on the Lord's day and as we can throughout the week as well. You see, at the heart of man's need is the exposition of God's holy word, taking one passage and one verse at a time, understanding it the way God intended it, and then applying it to the whole of life. The content here is made available to church members who are providentially hindered from joining us in person at the time. But it's so vital that you stay connected to the life and leadership of the church. But this content is also made available for anyone else outside of our church that would find it helpful. But we want you to know that as glad as we are that you stopped here and are joining us online, I am not yet your pastor and we are not yet your local church. Scripture teaches that it's vital that every person know Christ and then for every believer to be anchored in physical presence into the life of the local church, submitting themselves under the care of faithful, qualified pastors who can shepherd your soul. So I want to encourage you to find and join a local church, if possible, a solid Reformed Baptist church. And if you're not already a part of a faithful, biblical local church, we want to encourage you to come and join us in person as soon as possible. We pray that the content here is a blessing to your soul. The glory be to Christ. God bless you. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. We live in a day when the church is trying to reinvent itself to be relevant with the culture in a day when the church is by and large building itself on the cardinal virtues of smiling, enthusiasm, and overall happy, clappy kind of church services. And I believe that in our day, the church has all but lost the importance of the prayer of confession in our church services and in our lives. Just think about the idea of the prayer of confession. It sounds too Roman Catholic, doesn't it? A bit archaic, too legalistic, self-demeaning, overly demanding to dedicate time, an extended period of time. When in reality, it's only a few minutes, but it feels like a few decades when we place our heads under the waters of death and in the prayer of confession at the beginning of our service, we drown in the severity of our sin and we acknowledge the soaring seriousness of sin. Our more modern evolutionized mindset is that God is loving and so we completely jump over the severity of our sin because God is loving and we miss the entire backdrop for God's grace. But when we turn to scriptures, we see many lengthy prayers of confession and the Mount Everest of the prayers of confession, I believe, is before us this morning in Ezra chapter 9. We'll see another compliment to this prayer later in Nehemiah chapter 9, and there's another in Daniel 9 as well. But I'm thoroughly convinced with the rest of Reformed churches throughout the ages that we need weekly prayers of confession. We need this corporately to acknowledge our sin and our guilt collectively together. And you'll notice that that is traditionally followed by some sort of assurance of the pardoning grace of Jesus Christ. And the reason why we do that in part is because the intention is to set a regular pattern in our lives and in our homes throughout the week to where it's customary to 
repent of our sin, to confess it to God and to one another in our personal worship, in our homes, and in our churches, to come before our families and say, I have sinned in this specific way, and to confess that. When we blunt the edge of sin's sword, what we do is dilute the potency of our confession and we dilute the potency of our experience of forgiveness and healing. Yes, God is surely gracious, but when we skip over our sin and in essence dilute our sin... It's an affront to his grace. And his grace becomes almost a side note that we really didn't even need to begin with. It's no less than when someone sins against you in the most heinous manner, only to halfway apologize and acknowledge just a little bit of the pain and guilt before presuming upon your grace, assuming that you're just going to forgive and it's going to be all over with as quick as possible. And this and so much more is how we treat our relationship with God. And so this is why Reformed churches have historically modeled a prayer of confession every Lord's Day. And in many churches, they will recite the Ten Commandments Every Sunday, and then they will confess that we've broken those, and that will be followed by an assurance of God's pardon and His grace. Friends, we never could appreciate the marvelous work of God's grace until we understand the dark depths of our sin. And that is where Ezra 9 takes us this morning. Look with me in verses 1 through 5. If you'll remember last week, we looked at a house at war. A house at war. As we come to verses 6 through 15, we shift now to a house of prayer. And the temple was always intended to be a house of prayer. The temple that Ezra is now seeing having been completed and he is coming back in this second wave, Jesus would make clear in the Gospels that this was to be a house of prayer when he cleared it out and cleansed it from hypocrites. In our journey so far in Ezra 9, you'll recall that Ezra has taken three and a half months to get back to Jerusalem. Ezra the scribe has now been in the land for four and a half months and in that time, it's reported that there are people among God's people who are directly flouting the clear commands of God by taking wives, pagan wives, for themselves and their sons, a matter that the law of God strictly prohibited. Israel was an ethnic people. And it was through Israel that God would send forth the Messiah into the world to show, showcase his, his glory and his grace. But we saw last week that there were many provisions for those who were outside the ethnic people of Israel to be able to be grafted in to God's saving grace, his, his true people. And we also saw how there were people in ethnic Israel who were not truly God's people. So the primary factor here, I believe, is religion and not race. They are spiritually defiling themselves by marrying unbelieving wives, being locked in pagan marriages. And what they are then in essence doing is preaching a lie with their lives and their marriages. Because the implication of marriage is that Christ is joined to a bride. But when we take unbelieving wives, unbelieving husbands, and we yoke ourselves with them, we then proclaim a false gospel to the world that Christ is married to Satan, to Belial. And we obliterate the very picture of the gospel. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, famously said, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care. We live in a day when people are careless in their sin. 
Look with me in Ezra 9, verse 3. Ezra said, as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled or astonished. He is immediately struck with holy terror and rightly so. So he shreds his garment. He takes his cloak or his robe, his mantle, which was a long flowing robe over his garments, and he begins to rip it. He's customarily stripping himself to expose his shame and his grief. It's an act that would normally be affected as an outward expression of this grief when someone had died. But the truth is that there had been a death in Ezra 9. There was a spiritual death, which is so much worse. Now, it's interesting in Nehemiah chapter 13, I can't wait to get to this passage. When we see something similar happen, Nehemiah goes around like a good pastor, and he begins to take people who had done something similar, and he very gently and pastorally begins to grab them by the hair of the head and rips their head out of their hair out of their skull. How about that for pastoral counseling? That might be a good way to slow down sin in the church. We'll rip your hair out. It's interesting that Ezra doesn't do that. Ezra pulls out his own hair in self-humiliation and sorrow. Ezra knew that Israel was not to shave the edges of their beards. For one to have an unkept or an unshaven beard was unusual. It would signify great shame. It would signify defeat before a foreign army or mourning of some sort. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, they ripped the beard of the suffering servant. So these are the external expressions of Ezra's mourning and grief when the community comes under attack. He feels in his bones the heaviness of the supreme travesty of forsaking the living God to run after fleeting sinful flesh. So we're four and a half months in to his ministry and sin is being revealed. Prayers are going up and the word of God is slicing hearts to the core. Look with me in verse four. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithfulness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. They begin to gather around Ezra, being struck in fear. Because Ezra knew from Joshua 7 the consequences of one sin in the camp when the entire army of Israel was defeated as a result. We knew the consequences of one sin in the church in Acts 5 when God begins to strike people dead for their sin. 1 Peter 4.17 says that judgment begins with the household of God. And we see that played out in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with Jesus' letters to the church. How are we to call on anyone else to repent if we are not repenting ourselves? So what should be the response in the life of the people of God and In the wake of their sin, one word, the word tremble. This is the formula for awakening and revival. The law of God is preached. The hearts of God's people are pricked and people confess their sin. They seek God. They don't confess the sins of their neighbors. They're overcome with their own sin. And they realize that the seriousness of sin calls for no half measures. And they seek forgiveness and holiness. This is where Ezra is. The question for them, the question for us today. In light of such rampant depravity, why are our eyes always so dry? My eyes shed streams of tears, Psalm 119 says. Because people do not keep your law. Matthew Matthew Henry said they profane the crown of their peculiarity. They sought pleasures and alliances from the world 
They sought the world's provision, protection, and pleasures, degrading themselves before God. God has called his people to be one holy Catholic or universal church. Casual compromise with Christlessness, sympathy with sin always casts long shadows. In Nehemiah chapter 1, we see Nehemiah will weep, he'll fast, and he'll pray for days. But what I want to see in this passage is our heads are put under the fountain of the weight of our sin, almost without reprieve. I want you to look with me in verses 6 and 7. First of all, shame, the soaring seriousness of sin. Whatever happened to sermons dedicated to the seriousness of sin. Of sin. Number two, verses eight and nine, we see revival, repairing the ruins of sin. And number three, in verses 10 through 15, we see relapse, guilty as charged, no hope but grace. Look with me, number one, shame, the soaring seriousness of sin. Here's the prayer of Ezra, beginning in verse six. Saying, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. God, my face is beat red. I can't even look up. I'm so embarrassed. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands. To the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. It's interesting that Ezra begins with I and my. Describing his own shame. But the rest of the prayer makes use of the pronouns us, we, and our. What's striking is that Ezra doesn't seem to have been in sin himself. Ezra's not taking pagan wives. Why is Ezra confessing this sin to God? Because Ezra sees himself intimately connected with God's covenant people. Ezra realizes that what we do personally affects us corporately as a covenant community of faith. And Ezra knows that in his flesh, he is no better than they are. Ezra is made of the same clay feet. He has the same dark chest. He is prone to wonder. And Ezra just as well say what we can admit this morning, which is this, but by the grace of God, there go I. There is nothing in the vilest sinner that you are not capable of yourself, dear friend. But primarily, Ezra sees God's people the way Paul sees God's people. What affects one part of the body affects the whole body. In our first covenantal head, I, Adam, we all sin. But in our last covenantal head, Jesus Christ, we're all redeemed. So yes, God is going to hold each specific individual who sins accountable for their sin. The soul that sins is the soul that dies. And those of the following generations should not be punished for the sins of the fathers. Yes, yes, yes. But when sin rears among God's people, we are all affected. And even if we are not all directly at fault on a specific point of indictment, we all bear responsibility for that because we're one body. One scholar explains it this way. It's not just that individuals in the community have sinned. It is that the community has sinned in becoming such a place where these actions occur uninterrupted. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So Ezra shows solidarity with his people. He doesn't point fingers at them. He sits in the boat with them. But this raises a very interesting question, doesn't it? What about modern calls for national repentance? We've been flooded in our own woke generation. 
of critical race theory with calls for white people to repent of their whiteness and to repent as a nation for the horrible heritage that we have, that we need to pay reparations to the black community and we need to repent of all of our slavery and the horrific things that have been involved in our country. How do we respond to something like that in light of Ezra? I love how C.S. Lewis addresses this issue. He wrote a short essay entitled, The Dangers of National Repentance. I went back and read it this week. He was looking at a younger generation of Brits who were so eager to confess all of the sins of Britain. Lewis expressed that if he met an old man who had fought in the war who was trained and raised to be very proud of his country. And he said, if I hear that man confessing the sins of his nation, now that means something to me. But when I hear a young person who's done nothing but assert his own moral superiority because he and all of his buddies see all the things that they don't like, what is that? It's so little understanding of the context. It's so much personal pride. And it sounds like a morally superior prick standing outside of his people that he don't understand, pointing at things that he don't like, like a self-righteous Pharisee. That is not the posture of Ezra at all. What is the posture of Ezra? Look with me in verse 6. Oh my God. He cries out to God. He takes this upon himself, not looking at them, identifying as one of them, as a man of God's law and as a man of prayer. Ezra was a man of prayer. Look in Ezra 8, verse 21. Before they even set out on the journey, he fasted and he prayed. Ezra was a man of prayer and Ezra was a man of fasting and praying. Ezra doesn't pray as an excuse for acting. There are times when people hide behind prayer and it's a form of cowardice because they should be acting and instead we're just going to pray. But at the same time, Ezra doesn't just act without praying, going on in his own strength. We see both. But how easy would it have been Ezra just just to simply stand morally superior to his people and blame them? How easy would it have been for him, like us, to activate his inner lawyer and defend himself? God, it's not my fault. God, I told him. God, I've already warned him. It's not that big of a deal anyway. But instead, he comes with an open confession of sin. Oftentimes, our confessions look completely different. I made a mistake. I'm not perfect. But then again, I never claimed to be perfect. So, so Lord, thank you for doing what you were supposed to do so that you could put me back on my little merry road of life with an ease conscience. Not perfect. (laughs) Who do we really think we are to describe the depths of our depravity is I'm not perfect. Well, you can say that again. And so instead of calling sin, sin, what we tend to do is to weaken the waters of confession by naming it things like a mistake, a little mishap, an imperfection here or there, a bit of weakness, or dare I even say brokenness. It's a mental illness. What we tend to do is we, we shift the responsibility from sin as being something that we do as rebellious perpetrators And we begin to act as if sin is nothing more than an illness or a brokenness that happens to come upon otherwise good people like us. We change the name of sin and we gut the sin altogether rather than taking responsibility of it. Other times, unlike Ezra, we may soften sin in this way. We tend to flatten sin out. Yes, I sin. 
And I'm not perfect, but hey, you're not perfect either. And you're a sinner. And really, we're just all sinners. We're, we're all sinners here. It's really not that big a deal because we, we all are. And it blunts the edge of the sword. But look at Ezra's response in verse 6. I am ashamed and blush. It's the word humiliated. It literally means shame of face. God, I can't even lift up my face to you. Having such a defiled conscience after everything that you've done, after everything that we've done. He's like the repentant tax collector in Luke chapter 19, verses 8 through 14, who said that he prayed, but he couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. Lord, be merciful. In Jeremiah 6, verses 14 and 15, and in Jeremiah 8, 11 and 12, leading up to the exile, the prophet Jeremiah said, That in the light of the magnitude of their sin, which would drive them from their land in the exile, that they had lost the ability to blush. The indictment against them is that their faces were no longer beat red at the the sight of that which is heinous and scandalous before God. Friends, we know that in our day to day, we are so numb to holiness. We're so easily entertained by things that we should be absolutely ashamed of and disgusted in the presence of. Look with me in verse 6. Our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. The very things that put Jesus on the cross forms as entertainment for us. Iniquity refers to sin. It's lawlessness. It's a breaking of God's commandments, transgressing over the law. Look with me in verse 6. He says that it's risen above his head. Have you ever been in a situation to where you thought, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in over my head now and I realize it. Ezra is saying, not only are we in over our head, even worse, our guilt has consumed not only us, it has risen up to heaven. It's like overlooking your garbage can and beginning to throw trash right outside the back window. And someone says, what in the world are you doing? And you think it's just a piece of trash or two. We'll pick it up at the end of the week. And you keep doing that. And after a year or two, you look out the back window and now you can't even see the sky because the trash is the sky. Their weeds have now become jungles. And what's interesting in verse 6 Unlike our normal practice, you see, we typically lament the consequences of sin. Because those are more immediately felt. What we fail to lament is the important offense that sin is to God himself, which is supremely more important. We read in Psalm 51.4 that says, Against you only, God, have I sinned. Psalm 80, 38, 4 says, For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Four times in this passage we see the word guilt. Guilt is one of the most powerful emotions that a human being can possibly experience. Guilt and shame go all the way back to the garden. And our own parenting When our children have sinned, we'll tell our children when we're disciplining them, we'll ask them, do you feel guilty? And they do because you can see it over their faces. Yes, daddy, we feel guilty. Sweetheart, do you know why you feel guilty? No, daddy, why? Because you are guilty. You are guilty. Guilt, when it is rightly used in the conscience is a wonderful kindness of God to us. When it, was, when it is wrongly used, it is a terror in the hands of Satan. But when it is rightly used, 
Guilt is like taking your temperature. It's not the ultimate issue. It's a sign that there's a root, a deeper heart issue that needs a remedy applied to it. But today we've done everything we can to erase any semblance of the word or concept of biblical guilt. Today what we need is more self-esteem, more self-help. Instead of go and sin no more, today it's carry on and feel guilty or shame no more. Do we have dry eyes? Do we have untorn clothes? Do we have untrimmed beards? Do we no longer know how to blush? I want to take you back to the year 1669. A Puritan by the name of Ralph Venning wrote a book called The Sinfulness of Sin. And he wrote that sin is, quote, high treason against the majesty of God. But it scorns to confess its crime. Venning was looking around at the Black Plague that was making its way through Europe. It made its way through there in the 14th and the 18th centuries, but particularly in 1664 and in 1665, London was the ground zero for the last great outbreak of the bubonic plague. Some counts rise as high as 100,000 people, over 20% of the city's population would be introduced to this horrific death. They say that two-thirds of the people infected with it would die within six days. There's a reason why it's called black death. The victims, historians say, would begin with swollen lymph nodes. It would be followed by frequent pneumonia. That would turn into hideous coughing spasms that would then spread the infection all the more. The skin of the very victim himself would begin to decay. It would result in unutterable agony, fever, chills, black spots all over the body, and with no time, death would follow. And in the midst of that, Ralph Venning wrote another word. And he began to describe the seriousness of sin in a work called Sin, the Plague of Plagues as so much worse than even the bubonic plague itself. Sin erodes our flesh, it destroys our souls, it takes over our lives, and it kills everyone in its path. This is why Martin Luther said, Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, when he said repent, will that the whole life of believers should be repentance. When we covenant together as a church, and we read that covenant when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we commit to fight against our own sin. To refuse to be the source of sorrow that plague God's people. And that rightful guilt then sets up a display that we'll look at in just a few moments of a beautiful display of the grace of God in Christ. Look with me in verse 7. Ezra recalls that from the days of our fathers to the current day, they have been consumed, there it is again, in great guilt. And rightly so. They've been back in the land for 80 years after their exile. And looking back before the exile, Ezra recalls that it was of the sin of all of them, and he specifies kings and priests that gave them into the hands of the pagan king of Babylon. And look in your Bibles. God gave them over to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, to utter shame. And this is exactly what God promised would happen to covenant breakers. So it's no surprise that he did. But in verse 7, it's interesting that Ezra is acknowledging that ultimately it is not an earthly prince that sent him them there. It is God who is doing all of this. God did this and we deserved all of this. Proverbs 26, 11 says, like a dog, you want a good word picture? Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. And every parent that has young children is now gagging because you know what that's like. 
the very wickedness that got into them this mess to be exiled to begin with, to which God responded with this marvelous mercy of bringing them back into the land with two exiles. Now they're 80 years back into the land. The temple has been re- rebuilt. The altar is in place. They've celebrated the Passover. And what is their response to God but to go back and do the same exact wicked things that started everything to begin with? Are you like me? Do you ever look at old Israel and think, wagging your finger, what fools only to consider how often we live on the same hamster wheel, going back to the same vomit that God saved us from, and eating from it when God has provided superior pleasures of holiness. Do you ever feel like you're relapsing back into the hamster wheel, going back to the same sin, almost like you just can't help yourself? Friends, we are more vulnerable to sin than we realize. And our weeds become jungles quicker than we think they will. We move now from number one, sin, the soaring seriousness of sin, to number two, revival, repairing the ruins of sin. They've trashed out their lives. And look with me in verse eight. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God. Now the sun is piercing through the darkness. To leave us a remnant, a word used often in the Old Testament, and to give us a secure hold. The King James says a nail. The New King James says a peg. It's a foothold, a place of security upon which to plant your feet. God has given us a secure hold within his holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves Yet our God has not forsaken or abandoned us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love. The King James says his mercy or his favor before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. Three times they acknowledge themselves, Ezra does, to be slaves. So even with their relative freedom under the Persian Empire, they are still slaves under the tyranny of a foreign nation. And the truth is that they have sold themselves into slavery. You know the only thing worse than being in slavery Selling yourself to sign up voluntarily for slavery. Something that I think politically we are just dying to do today. We cannot have enough slavery. We need more slavery. But how much worse would sin? Sin always promises pleasure and freedom. Sin always delivers distress and bondage. Look with me in verse 8. But now, the covenant-keeping God of Israel has given them a sense of security through building the sanctuary. And then the Bible says, not only have they come back to this holy place, but that he may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving. It means that God has made our eyes shine. He has revived our spirits, the inner core of our being once again. Ezra acknowledges them corporately as slaves, the very thing that God saved them out of Egypt from and rescued them, and now they've sold themselves back into. If you want to sum up the story of Israel, it's this. From grief to glory, from repentance to rejoicing to repeat. That's the days of our lives. That's the days of their lives. That's the soap opera that is on constant repeat. Verse 
And it begs of a greater rescue, a secure salvation, an outpouring of grace from this unrelenting sin. Look with me in verse 9. He repeats that they're slaves and that God has not forsaken them, but he's extended his steadfast love to them. How did God do that? Relatively speaking, for a brief time, God relieved them of their misery. He used pagan kings to send them back to their land. He opened up a way, a hope, and a future. And he's placed them right back in the middle of blessing. Twice we see the word revive and then the word repair. They're a remnant, relatively speaking. And they're watching restoration unfold before their eyes. God has given them a reprieve. They've survived in their sin. And now look at the phrase used, to repair its ruins. To give them protection, which would refer to a wall around a vineyard. God has raised them back up from the ashes. I love how Martin Lloyd-Jones put it. He said that the ultimate test of our spirituality is our amazement at the grace of God. It's not how many books we've read, how many good deeds we've done, how well we've lived, or are you utterly amazed that God has not completely destroyed you? Are you utterly amazed that he allowed you to get up and breathe and walk around? How often do we walk around like we are entitled to the world? You are entitled to death, and anything more than that is the grace of God. A discontented Christian is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard in my life. And the fact that God would give us glory and put his spirit in us and create us for eternity is mind-boggling. Isaiah 58, Isaiah 61, Amos 9, 11, Acts 15, 16, we see this phrase, repair its ruins. In light of the New Testament, the Bible uses this phrase to show us that God is restoring, restoring the ruins of sin. He's raising up a new temple, Jesus Christ. And that temple, too, would be put in the ground or raised three days later, and God would resurrect a people for his glory, a church in whom his presence would dwell. God is repairing the ruins. And now we we join him by extending the kingdom of God as far as the curse is found. We join him in that mission in repairing the ruins. Derek Kidner said he had a high sense of the glory they had betrayed, And he could not be reconciled to what they had become. But the very fact that there is any remnant left was a small piercing through the tunnel of a light at the end. It showed that God is gracious. And if he's done it before, if he's shown us a little reviving, verse 8, some reviving, verse 9, a brief moment of favor, verse 8, then surely God would potentially show the same and more again. So we're learning something of the character of God. And let's back up just a moment to make sure we get the lessons. Because I don't know about you, but I would much rather learn the lessons of someone else or maybe my own wants than to continue to make them time and time again. Lesson number one, God makes ethical demands on his people, and he has the right to do that. And you can call him legalistic, or you can call him whatever he wants, and he does not care. (laughs) He makes ethical demands on his people. Number two, his righteousness and justice requires punishment for sin, period. Some of you say, Man, I ain't never had a ticket in my life. Really, you've never had a ticket. Nobody have been pulled over 15 times. Never had a ticket in your life, but been pulled over 15 times. How does that work out? I talk my way out of it every single time. Anyone guilty of that? No, you cry your way out of it every single time. This is a ticket that you'll never talk your way out of. Who cares how well you talk? <laughs> 
Number three, God is merciful in the midst of their sin. God is merciful in the midst of their sin. And he provides reviving. He provides for them what they don't deserve and can't do for themselves. Number one, we saw the shame, the soaring seriousness of sin, the shame of our own soul. Number two, we saw revival, repairing the ruins of sin. We are the people who know what to do with our shame. We go to Christ. We repent. We deal biblically with our sin. We don't just medicate ourselves out of our shame. We deal with the heart of the issue. We live in a day now where we just think we can medicate ourselves out of anything, which leads to more medication until we actually deal with whatever the issue is. Number three. Number three, and finally, look at relapse. Guilty as charged, no hope but grace. And now, O oh, our God, Ezra concludes, what shall we say after this? What do you say when you find yourself in the midst of the same sin over and over and over? What can you say? What does Ezra say? For we have forsaken your commandments. This begins Ezra's great confession. What he is doing is he is confessing. You want to know the best definition I've ever heard of confession? Confession is siding with God against yourself. And what Ezra is doing in this great prayer is he is siding with God against himself. And he is siding with God even when that means against God's people. Verse 11, he dis- explains, Which you commanded by your servants the prophets, saying, The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure, with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Here's what the prophets have said. He's quoting directly from either Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 3, or there's many other passages that reference the same exact things that he's quoting. So he could be quoting from any number of places or putting several of them together. Do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and live and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. That's what the prophet said. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such a a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us? So that there should be no remnant nor any to escape. O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is to this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt for none can stand before you because of this. God, we are guilty as charged on every account. And we cast ourselves before you naked before all hiding nothing in full confession of our sin, calling it the way that you see it, with great contrition of heart, open before all, siding with God against ourselves, in dire need of repentance. Repentance involves a desire and intent to turn from that sin, to trust in Jesus Christ, an intent to trust Christ and ask for his strength to help us not to go back to that sin, but rather to cling to God's word and his ways. And this prayer in and of itself is a demonstration of repentance. It's a little bit different from saying, oh, my bad, my bad, that one's on me. Look with me in verse 10. Ezra's speechless. It's it's implied, but he never even directly appeals to God's mercies. Their actions speak for themselves. Look with me in verse 9. The Bible says that God has not forsaken them, but in verse 10, they have forsaken God's law. 
And so he quotes from the prophets. God, we've made unholy unions with this world. We fit into this culture. We look very little like, the, unlike the filth around us. And I'm taking this one on me. He acknowledges that after all that God has done for them, they have gone back to the same sin. And I want you to see one phrase in verse 13 that is absolutely striking. God, you have punished us less than our iniquities deserved. Are you telling me that God has brought in a foreign nation, a tyrannical pagan king, he has destroyed their entire city, he burned down their temple, Nebuchadnezzar would kill all of their wives and children in front of them. He would take back as slaves the captives that were left. And he would put them in chains and they would serve him forever. And Ezra is saying, praise God, at least he punished us less than we deserved. If that is less than they deserved, I would hate to see what our sins actually deserve. What they deserve is the fury of an eternal hell without a single hint of mercy. And Ezra is thankful that God has shown mercy in his judgment. This is not some hot-headed, quick-tempered overreaction on God's part. This is God's settled anger justly responding to sin. And he says that God is perfectly justified in doing so. Verse 15, he is just, he is righteous. For none can stand before you because of this. They have made the great escape out of Egypt and Babylon, but it turns out that you couldn't take Egypt and Babylon out of them. I was in a setting this week that I would not specify where or what, just a setting in our community. And I was just in watching the things around me happening. I was listening to the conversations. Just a bit aloof watching people interact and come in. It's a pretty busy place in our community. And studying this passage, and I just stand back and I think, it is unbelievable how wicked our culture has become. And I am not detached from that. I see it in myself. And it just began to plague me just how much the church follows the culture. Rarely do we see the church actually leading the culture. What happens is the wickedness of the culture begins to seep into the church. And then you have spineless Christians and spineless preachers who don't really want to touch those things because it could make the giving in the church go down or the crowds on Sunday a little bit less. So let's don't preach on things like feminism that have completely plagued the church. Let's don't preach on things like Fathers who are refusing to do their duties, and maybe that's the reason why we're in the mess that we're in. Let's don't preach on things that, I don't know, hit a little bit too close to home. And before you know it, the church looks no different from the culture. And then we think this is just normal. This is just the way we've always done it. There are a million applications to that. Ezra's question is, who are you, O sinful man, to think that you can offend the most royal sovereign and then dare to stand before his high and holy throne? The idea is that due to their sin, they can't stand in favorable communion with God. In other words, they don't have a leg to stand on. Just as threatened in Exodus 32.10 under Moses' ministry, God had every reason to wash his hands of them. And you know what? He could have destroyed all of them because there were other tribes, there were other peoples that God have, could have raised up to fulfill his promises through them. He did not need these people. But Hebrews 12 says that he's a loving father. He's a loving father. 
And if we belong to God, if we're in Christ, there is no condemnation for us. We are not finally condemned. But God does discipline us just as you would expect any healthy father to do his son. But they have no excuses for their sin. We teach our children when they sin, the answer is this. There is no excuses, sir. There is no excuses, sir. Romans 3.19 says the law cuts down every mouth. Psalm 103.3 says if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. The Puritans had a lot to say about this doctrine. I want you to listen to Puritan Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson said, if sin were on one side and hell on the other, I would rather leap into hell than willingly offend my God. He said, either sin must drown or the soul must burn. Oh, that we would therefore, while we are on this side of the grave, make our peace with God. Tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this be our repenting day. I watched a dear family member draw their last breath until their body turned cold and they woke up in eternal glory. One day you will draw your last breath, dear friend. It might be today, it might be tomorrow, or it might be just a few days. But one day you'll turn white, your body will turn cold, and they will put you in a hole. And the exhortation is is that tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this be our repenting day. Well, it's not too late. Watson also said that the Christian should always keep two books by him. One in which to write his sins, that he may be humble. The other in which to write his mercies, that he might be kept thankful. I commend both, both of those books to you. Read them every single day. You say, is it really that bad? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is that bad. The Puritans spoke mightily of this issue. I encourage you to get the book, The Valley of Vision, a book of Puritan prayers. Read them in your families. One Puritan said, sin is no game, no toy, no babble. Let me never forget that the heinousness of sin lies not so much in the nature of the sin committed as in the greatness of the person sinned against. When I am afraid of evils to come, comfort me by showing me that in myself I am a dying, condemned wretch, but that in Christ I am reconciled, made alive, and satisfied. Another said, keep me ever mindful of my natural state, but let me not forget my heavenly title or the grace that can deal with every sin. Another said, grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, the exceeding wonder of grace. Blessed are those who mourn with a broken heart and a tender conscience because they will be comforted. It was not the self-righteous man who confessed his own righteousness and the sins of his peers. It was the man who said, God, I am unworthy to even come before you and lift up my face. God said it was that sinner that went home justified. So have you ever felt this way? As soon as God does a marvelous, matchless work of grace in your life, your response is a royal relapse right back where you started in depravity. You say, what's the way home? Look in Ezra chapter 9. A prayer of confession. Repentance, a time and time and time again, and forgiveness. And know that forgiveness and pardon and grace is the very specialty of our Father in heaven. Because every time, time and time again, his hands are always out for a warm welcome and a gracious reception to all who turn to him in Christ.
The great climax of this is in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel was alive when the exile happened. And he's telling the people what's happening. He's pronouncing the spiritual verdict. That God has scattered his people in their sin, but there is hope. There's a valley of dry bones. There's nothing but death because the glory of God has departed because they have offended God. You say, man, what, a, what an offensive sermon. You ever consider how offended God is all week long? And Ezekiel is promising this new covenant where God will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And the promise is that God is going to vindicate his holy name. The word is that he's going to gather his people back together, cleanse them of their sin. He's going to give them a brand new heart. And then he's going to put his law in their heart when he saves them. And he's going to cause them to walk in his ways. How good of God to step in and to forgive our guilt, to relieve our shame, to do away with our sin, and then give us everything that we need to please him and walk in joy. The Puritan Richard Sibb said, There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. John Newton addressed this as well. You ever heard the song Amazing Grace? The author John Newton put it this way. Are not you amazed sometimes that you should have so much as a hope? That poor and needy as you are, the Lord thinketh of you. But let not all of you feel discouraged. For if our physician is mighty, our disease cannot be desperate. And if he casts none out that come to him, why should you fear? Our sins are many, but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness is greater. We are weak, but he is power. Most of our complaints are owing to unbelief and the remainder of a legal spirit. And these evils are not removed in a day. So flee to Christ. Our only hope be warmly received by him time and time and time again. Ezra is asking nothing from God but mercy. No shopping lists. But he gives us a special prayer that I think ought to be in our lives from time to time. You see, some of you are tempted to live in this prayer. Some of you may be tempted to live in a state of morbid introspection, constantly going through the trash of your soul. And at some point, you have to realize that you're either going to forsake your sin and trust in Jesus Christ, atoning work for you, or you're going to try to pay your own way and look to your own inner resources to deal with your sin, and you're just going to live in the dump. But even as those who have been assured of the grace that we have in Christ, knowing that we don't have condemnation, that Jesus Christ has bore the penalty that we deserve... This may not be where we need to live, but I believe it is a place that we need to return, especially from time to time. And no greater time to do that than in our own day, when we're watching wickedness unfold like maybe we have never seen in our nation. We are slaughtering children by the thousands and hundreds of thousands constantly every day. Rampant sexuality and divorce and every other perverse thing. I mean, there were the days when we were trying to help men learn to lead their families, women to come home and stop working outside the home and actually train their children in the fear of God, submit to their husbands and families to be holy and happy and extend something of the work of God through their families, their children, their grandchildren. Now it seems like we're just trying to get the world to stop castrating their children. It is that wicked. But it's the plan. And even in the church, how often we just follow the culture. Now we're fighting over a plethora of issues that were in the culture just the other day. 
And now you see it splitting denominations. And so it's a place to which we may return. But as we return and feel the weight of our sin, may the purpose of this be to drive us to Christ, that we would bask in his grace and glorify his mercy. 1 John 1 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know about you, but I personally need that every single day. Because I have clay feet just like you do. And the point is that God is not stingy with his mercy. You may think after hearing a sermon like this that we would be like begging dogs just trying to jump for a crumb, but it's the wrong picture. God's not stingy with his mercy at all. He unleashes the flood of heavens and he is eager to do so. Our sins, they are many. His mercy in Jesus Christ is more. It's a call to be divorced from the world, to be united to Christ, to be unmixed and undivided in heart. Normally, naturally, we have war in our hearts and in our homes, Ezra 9, 1 through 5. But Jesus Christ offers peace through faith and repentance in the gospel. Look with me at one last passage and we'll close. Psalm 103, which is also our benediction. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103, verses 11, 12, and 13. How does God deal with us in our sin? And if in your mind, as we're walking through this, you can't even think about your own sin because you're thinking about the sins of the people around you. You have not even begun to listen to the sermon or the text. It's a corporate solidarity. Together, we have a sin. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Some of you had a terrible earthly father, and the idea of a father sends chills up your spine because you don't understand. But I want you to see the picture of a godly father. In verse 13, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. One preacher said that he puts a sign in the pond to which he throws our sin, and it reads, no fishing. They've been buried in the ocean of his mercy, and we have been set free. We have been rescued from the greatest penalty that's ever been given, of the greatest crime that has ever been committed, for the greatest delivery that's ever been undertaken. In the words of Corey Timboon, there is no pit that is so deep. That God's love is not deeper still. Father, we thank you that wherever you find us, because you find us, we don't go looking for you. Whatever mess we create of our life, whatever vomit we return to, feeling over our heads, our sins reaching to the heavens, God, there's no pit so deep that your love does not pierce through to the bottom of it. And we thank you that you have taken us from the miry pit and you have set our feet upon a rock, a solid rock. You have forgiven us. Help us to live with a clean conscience, without guilt and shame. Father, when we sin in our hearts and in our families this week, and we allow weeds Father, we pray that we would pick those weeds through repentance quickly and not allow those weeds to become jungles. Father, we pray that you would help us to be a holy people and happy so. Father, we thank you that as our sins are great, your mercy is more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.